Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. What a difference a week makes, eh? Seven days ago, we were talking about one of the closest tours to France ever, but in the end, we had the biggest margin of victory seen in almost a decade. I'll be looking back at the final week of the men's race and the first day of the women's, as well as filling you in on a huge number of transfer rumors. This week in the world of racing, we learned that while Simon and Adam Yates are now on different teams, they are still working together in sync. I really do love that clip. Uh, we also learned that even during the processional part of the stage, pro cyclists are illegally fast. If you've ever set off a speed camera whilst riding a bike, I would love to hear from you in the comments section below. Uh, we also learned what the worst part of the Tour de France was for Tadej Pugacar. Every time Marc Soler looked me behind in, in Col de la Loze with his eyes, with his scary eyes, and yeah, that was uh, the most terrifying moment. He's a real character, isn't he? The stage he was talking about there was stage 17, which went over the Col de la Loze. There, Pugaccia cracked and Vinegar put the Tour de France out of reach, barring crashes or incidents. The previous day, he put in what he described as the performance of his life in the only individual time trial of the race, putting over a minute and a half into Pugaccia, who in turn was over a minute quicker than anybody else. Up until that point, it really felt like the race hung in the balance, but there, the scales tipped firmly in the favour of the Dane probably the only scales in the world in which Vignogor is a heavyweight. So, a second consecutive Tour de France for Vignogor, which now puts him equal with Tadej Pugacar. Now, Pugacar's preparation was far from ideal, as we all know, but even without that crash at Liège-Baston-Liège, you've got to imagine it would still have been incredibly hard to win this edition, given the strength of Vignogor and the entire Jumbo-Visma team. It was the biggest margin of victory at the race since 2014, where Vincenzo Nibali was 7 minutes 37 in front of Jean-Christophe Perrault, and the biggest gap from the top to the bottom step of the podium since 1997. This is how the top 10 on GC looked in the end. Adam Yates on that third step of the podium, his first ever at a Grand Tour. Brother Simon in fourth, Rodriguez slipping to fifth after that nasty fall on stage 20. Peo Bilbao took his best ever GC result at the Tour de France with sixth. Jai Hindley one place behind that in seventh. Best rider from a French team, that was Felix Gall in eighth, whilst the best Frenchman was David Godou in ninth. Scant consolation, I think, given his ambitions going into it. Rounding out the top 10 was Guillaume Martin of Team Coffles, but they had a very successful race, of course. Now, amazingly, seven of the top eight riders on GC won at least one stage of the race, and there were a total of 17 different stage winners, the most that we have seen in a long, long time. Sepp Kuss slipped outside of the top 10 into 12th position, and I was gutted for him. He was involved in that same crash as Carlos Rodriguez and was very bruised and battered, but did soldier on to the finish. One place ahead of him was Thibaut Pino in 11th, but my word did he put on a show on the final mountain stage of his final Tour de France. Just listen to this atmosphere on Pino Corner on the Petit Ballon in his home region. I don't know about you, but that gives me goosebumps. Fair play Thibaut Pino. He's given his fans a roller coaster ride throughout his career, and so it seemed fitting to continue in that vein on stage 20 there. Now, despite the fight for the GC effectively being over after stage 17, we were still blessed with some incredible racing on the remaining stages. Even on that day, Felix Gall's win was brilliant, but the following day into Bourg en Bresse provided even more excitement, in my opinion. Now, there's nothing quite like the will-they-won't-they-ever breakaway during a sprint stage. Uh, Victor Campanarts was the hero of that day, single-handedly doing a pull so fast, the sprinters' teams were unable to catch them. Unfortunately for Lotto Destiny, Pascal Aincorn was unable to get the better of Kasper Asgrain in the sprint, who took his first-ever stage win at the race. And the Dane was back at it the following day on what was my favourite stage of the last week, possibly of the whole race, in fact. Flat out from start to finish, but in the end, Askrain was joined by Matty Mohoric and Ben O'Connor, and they held off an incredibly strong group to the line. 
O'Connor did what he could, but inevitably it was going to be a sprint at deux, and it couldn't have been much closer. Mohoric winning it with a very well-timed bike throw. An incredible performance, and one that was only bettered by his post-race interview. Sometimes you feel like you don't belong here because you're, everyone is so incredibly strong that you, you struggle to hold wheels sometimes. Even today, during the day, I was thinking the whole day, like how is... And you know that the guy who's pulling is suffering just as much as you do, but it's just cruel to then be able to, to follow the decisive attack when Kasper went. I don't know, like he was so incredibly strong. He went into, on the attack yesterday and won the stage. And today, to have the will and determination to do it all over again, like you just feel... You just feel that you don't belong here. And then I, I followed him. I knew I have to make everything perfect. And I, I tried my best because I, I not just for myself, also for Gino and for, for the team. And then at the end, you almost feel like you betrayed them because you, you beat them not to, do, to the line. But yeah, it's just uh, the way professional sport is. Everyone wants to win. And uh, obviously, if I want to win, I need to take the wheel of Kasper and, uh, and then try to beat him on the line the last 50 meters. But yeah, I just feel like so many things right now. I am sure that most of you have seen that full interview, but if you haven't, it's well worth searching it out. Mohoric managed to perfectly summarise just how beautiful but brutal the sport of professional cycling is, in a second language no less, just minutes after the fastest stage of the entire race. Uh, Pogacar's win on stage 20 clearly meant a lot to him. In fact, he took to Instagram that evening, seemingly worried that his finish line celebrations were a little over the top. However, winning the internet that day was his teammate Rui Oliveira, who wrote in reply, Celebration was too much, you just want a stage of the Tour de France, bro. I celebrate like that when I win on FIFA. Fantastic. Uh, Bugatcha's stage win there was his second at this race, which is actually his worst record at a Grand Tour. He's won three stages of every Grand Tour that he's done up to this Tour de France. It also marks the end of an era. Finally, next year, Pugaccia won't be eligible for the Young Riders classification, a competition he's owned for four editions now. Incidentally, no other rider has ever been on a Grand Tour podium five times before the age of 25, which is what Pugaccia has done now. Anyway, back to stage 20, because that was also the day in which Giulio Ciccone of Lidl Trek won the KOM jersey, the first non-GC winner of that competition since Roman Bardet in 2019. Thoroughly well-deserved it was too, not just by Ciccone, but by the whole team, who did much to support him, particularly on that day. Uh, Ciccone is the first Italian to win the KOM competition, incidentally, since Claudio Chiapucci in the 90s. Speaking of which, we've just finished filming a documentary about Chiapucci, which you'll be able to watch in a couple of months' time. Jasper Philipson had already sewn up the green jersey some way before Paris, but would still dearly have loved to win a fifth stage on the Champ. He was close, but there was no cigar this time around. Bora Hansgrohe's Jordi Meyers had the positioning and the legs to sneak past the Belgian before the line. And not only was that Meyers' first Tour de France stage win, it was also his first win at World Tour level. His previous eight were all at dot pro or below. And he could not believe it when he crossed the line, could he? Uh, the last rider to win on the Champs-Élysées at their first ever Tour de France well, it wasn't that long ago, actually. It was Caleb Ewan back in 2019. And incidentally, if you're wondering why we didn't get that fantastic panning shot from the motorbike alongside the riders in that final sprint, it was because of this. Some crowd running onto that side of the road, getting in the way of the motorbike. Anyway, the big news that came out yesterday before the stage is that Jonas Vinigor is not going on holiday for the rest of this year. Far from it, in fact, because he revealed he's going to take one easy week before preparing for the Vuelta a España, which starts in just 33 days from now. Now, apparently, it has been part of the Jumbo Visma master plan since November, and no team has ever won all three Grand Tours in a single season. Uh, Yuma Visma are only the sixth team to have won the first two of any, any year. Moltini and Flandria did it in the 70s. Enoch Spran at the start of the 80s. Mercatoni Uno in the 90s. And Team Sky in 2018. And given what we now know, that both Roglic and Vinigur will be at the Welter, you've got to say they're going to be odds on to be the first team ever to do the triple. It was welcome news for many fans, I'm sure, but I'm not sure that Remco Avenepoel, Geraint Thomas and the rest were particularly pleased, and maybe you could add Roglic to that list too. Who knows? 
Right, I'll finish on the men's Tour de France by looking at the prize money, because I know a lot of you are interested in that. As you would expect, Jumbo Visma topped the table, taking home 664,280 euros. UAE Team Emirates won 455,000, and then there's quite a big drop to Ineos Grenadiers, who took 133,000. Bottom of the table, by quite some margin, are Team DSM Firminik, who won 12,180 euros. That works out as 72 euros per rider per stage, and that's before you take out tax, the percentages that go towards the anti-doping and team staff, etc. as well. Not a great race for them. Right, I would like your Tour de France ratings for this year out of 10. Was it a classic edition? Let me know your vote in the comment section down below. I'm going to give it a solid 9 out of 10. The suspension of GC may have been killed, but not until stage 17, and almost every single stage gave us a hell of a lot to talk about. I look forward to seeing whether or not you agree. Right, on to the Tour de France Femme Avec Zwift now, which kicked off yesterday with a road stage around Clermont-Ferrand. There was a bit of reluctance from anybody in the peloton to attack in the early part of the stage, but we did eventually get some moves from the likes of Marta Lack and April Tacy, but nothing really came to much. Unfortunately for Maria Benito of AG Insurance, the race was over before it had even really begun. She crashed early on in that stage and was taken to hospital, but thankfully she hadn't broken anything. The main action was centred around the only classified climb of the day, the Côte de Deux Tours. SD Works took control of the race there, and with at least three potential winners of the stage within the squad, it was hard for us and those racing to figure out what their plan was going to be. It soon became clear though when Belgian champion Lotte Kopecky went on the attack near the top of that climb. It was a move that either nobody could follow or nobody decided to follow. Her gap climbed steadily over the top and down the other side and with the chase behind not particularly cohesive, it ended up being a comfortable win for Kopecky, her first at the race. And it was a 1-2 for the team as well, with Vives finishing second after a lead out from Vollery. Now one rider who I noticed was absent from the GC favourites group over the top of the climb was Italian champion Elisa Longo Borghini. Not sure what happened to her there, but she did get back on over the top. The big losers on GC on stage one were Juliette Laboue and Rihanna Marcus, who both lost over a minute on the stage winner and a fair chunk of time on their key GC rivals. It was particularly disappointing for Laboue, who was fourth overall at the race last year and more recently, second overall at the Giro Donne. Now, the Tour de France fam Avec Zwift will continue today with an even punchier stage and culminate this weekend with a summit finish on the Col de Tourmalet on Saturday and an individual time trial to round out the race on Sunday. The race is available to watch live and on demand on GCN Plus if you're in Europe or the Asia Pacific, excluding China, Japan and New Zealand, or if you're in the Middle East or North Africa. I'm going to be watching intently from home this week as I take a few days off. Uh, to celebrate the second edition of this race, we've once again teamed up with Life Plus Wahoo, the team there, and their hashtag Embrace Every Moment campaign to offer something special to those of you who are living in the UK. If you'd like more details on that, simply head over to lifeplusyahoo.com forward slash Embrace Every Moment, and I promise it'll be worth your while. On the men's side, we have the Tour de Wallonie continuing through to Wednesday. That one is available worldwide. Whilst on Saturday, it's the Classica San Sebastian. Not one of cycling's monuments, but a very prestigious one-day race nonetheless. Five former winners are on the provisional start list, including Avonapool and Alaphilippe. Now, there are some territory restrictions on that one, so please check the app or the webpage to check if it's available where you are. Further to that, on Sunday it's the Circuit de Get Show, and then the Tour de Land starts this time next week, Monday the 31st of July, so plenty to feast your eyes on. And something else to feast your eyes on this week is our latest documentary, which is released tomorrow. It focuses on the Anglerou, a brutally steep green giant in the heart of the Asturian Mountains. Since its discovery and inclusion in the Boita Espana in 1999, rides have struggled up its fierce gradients, and fans flock there from around the world to witness the drama. Connor Dunn returned there recently for the first time since crawling his way up the climb at the 2017 Welter, and he's joined by David Miller, who faced his own demons there. In 2002, he crashed twice in heavy rain and fog ahead of that final climb. Here's a quick trailer for you. This climb alone is the pivotal point, I think, where we go into modern cycling. Es pura supervivencia y una batalla contra uno mismo. No hay más que es left. We 
both have unfinished business on the angler route, both gradients hitting almost 25%, will we conquer it? Or will it conquer us? Really trying to avoid putting my foot down. That film is out for all GUCM Plus subscribers to watch from tomorrow. Right then, just before I get onto that extensive list of transfer rumours, let's take a look back at the Tour de Wallonie, or at least the opening couple of stages. Uh, stage one was won by Filippo Ganna, after what looked to be a lead out for his teammate Elia Viviani. He was so powerful on the uphill drag to the line though, that nobody was able to come around him, not even his teammates. Stage two was won by Arno De Lee, his first win and a convincing one at that since fracturing his sternum, a collarbone and a rib at the four days of Dunkirk in mid-May. That is a mighty quick comeback. Uh, as things stand, after two stages, he is in the GC lead as well. Right, on to transfer talk then, and this all comes courtesy of Dan Benson and an article that he wrote which you can find free to read over on the GCN app. Uh, first up, the transfers and contract extensions that have been officially announced. Irishman Darren Rafferty has been snapped up by EF Education Easy Post. Uh, the 20-year-old finished runner-up at the Giro Next Gen in June and backed that up recently with a win in another very prestigious under-23 race last week, the Giro Ciclista della Valle d'Osta Mont Blanc, a race won by the likes of Pino and Sivakov in the past and Lenny Martinez last year. Lucinda Brandt has extended her contract with Lidl Trek, which will see her continue to compete on the road and in cyclocross until at least the end of 2025. On to the rumours then, some of which I'd heard, many of which were news to me. Two that I had heard were of the move of Matteo Jorgensen and Ben Tulit to Jumbo Visma from Movistar and Ineos Grenadiers respectively. That will further strengthen their climbing roster. Pascal Ackerman will reportedly move on from UAE Team Emirates at the end of this year and is set to join Israel Premier Tech along with a currently unnamed lead-out rider with Lotto Destiny at the moment. UAE Team Emirates are also reportedly losing Ryan Gibbons, he's been linked with a move to Lidl Trek, but they have extended the contracts of both Rui and Eva Oliveira and are apparently in talks with Pavel Sivakov. Danny Martinez is another rider set to move on from Ineos, quite probably to Bora Hansgrohe, but Freyle and Castrovieco will sign contract extensions alongside Geraint Thomas and Luke Rowe. Patrick Conrad is another rider that's been linked with Lidl Trek, and so too Theo Gagan Hart, who looks almost certain to move there from 2024. Matteo Sobrero is going to be moving away from Jaco and to Bora Hansgrohe, whilst Mara Schmidt is set to leave Sudal Quickstep and is apparently going to get a three year deal at Jaco Alula. Uh, with Fabio Jakobsen off to Team DSM Thermonic, Sudal Quickstep have signed up up-and-coming sprinter Luke Laperti, whilst it sounds like Robert Stannard could be on the verge of moving on from Alpecin and Michael Storr from Groupama FTJ. Their new teams are, as yet, unknown. Uh, you can read all about those rumours, plus a few more, over on the app, so we'll put a link to that in the description just down below. Right, that is all for this week. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the Tour de France Om as much as I did. Enjoy the Tour de France fam and I will see you again very soon.